Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Arno and the other organizers for the invitation to be here, which is a, a great pleasure. So this is a work that uh, Kevin Mimeria and, and Victor Gomez and I, Kevin and, and Victor are just here, have been doing for several years now. Uh, we are not, I am certainly not, an LLVM person. But we have to talk about C and C++. We've had these around for quite a long time now. These are more than 45 years old. They're still ubiquitous, good for LLVM, and they survive in various ways all the attempts that people have made to kill them off and replace them. As you know, notionally, these are languages defined by fine ISO standards. Right? Notional contracts between compiler writers and programmers by these fine ISO committees. And these have noble goals. Right? From the C standard preamble, the committee's overall goal was to develop a clear, consistent, and unambiguous standard for C so that everybody could live happily ever after. Okay, what have we actually got? If we look at the C standard, a uh, quick question, uh, just to check my assumptions here. How many of you have read some part of the C or C++ standard? I am very sorry for your loss. <laughs> How many of you have written some part of the C or C++ standard? I'm even sorrier for your loss. Uh, okay, then most of you know what I'm talking about. This is a very good audience for this talk. Uh, so you look into the ISO C11 and you find 702 pages of prose, English text. English text is well known as a good medium for expressing really precise things unambiguously and clearly. <laughs> yes? No. Right. So, so we're on to a loser uh, before we even start here. Um, worse, really, prose in general is not mechanized in any form whatsoever. Right? I'm not saying that we should be able to run the standard as a compiler, but the standard does not give us anything that we can use as a test oracle to test against, and it doesn't give us anything that we can use you know, if we're arguing with our colleagues about you know, the semantics of some subtle undefined behavior, then what happens is that, well, people read the text, and then they think about what it means, go back to point one, and then they debate with each other, and then they write long discussions on, well, what used to be comp.lang.c and a million other forums. Um, long gone, comp.lang.c. Who posted to comp.lang.c? Who doesn't even know what comp.lang.c was? Okay, about equal. Um, so, so this is rubbish, right? Uh, the standard is, doesn't actually define uh, what's allowed and what's not. And then, as we know, it's not just prose, but pretty subtle prose. And then, well, there are some real disagreements about, well, not about, but between what the standard says and uh, what implementations actually implement and what code using C actually relies on. And some of these are quite explicit. You have you know, large code bases using uh, F no strict aliasing, and the standard doesn't say anything about that at all. Right? That's just extra linguistic. And then we have implicit assumptions. So how much code out there depends on the address space being flat? I don't know. Nobody knows. ISO doesn't talk about that kind of thing. ISO tries really hard to be... This is a slight overstatement here. It tries really hard to be ambiguous and unclear about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it succeeds. 
Okay, so uh, do we have a clear, consistent, and unambiguous standard? No, we actually have many different Cs. We have ISO C modulo these questions of interpretation. We have each implementation which behaves in some particular way, but then with all of the different assortments of compiler flag choices. We have, maybe most importantly, but the hardest to investigate, the assumptions implicit in the code base of the bazillions of lines of C out there. And uh, slightly easier to investigate, but also quite tricky, we have what people believe C is. And that is really what I'm here for. Um, so, this is not the first time we've touched, as a research group, this kind of thing. So in a previous life, uh, um, Kevin and I and some other of our colleagues, especially Mark Batty, uh, helped make C and C++11 concurrency a bit less wrong than it would otherwise have been. Uh, so, while that was being developed, we engaged with the WT21 working group and we clarified what they were writing in text by doing honest mathematics and we found a bunch of problems and suggested some fixes. And what you have now in the standard, it's not perfect, but the text of that part of the C and C++ standards is in very close correspondence with the mathematical definitions that Mark and the rest of us developed and proved some things about. But that is only the tiniest part of C. What about all the rest? So what we've been doing uh, for the last few years, this is an exceedingly bifurcated room. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to run up and down and point to this one and then point to that one and vice versa. Uh, so what we've been doing for the last few years is um, to look at not all of C, but a larger fragment of the language. Right? And we've done two kinds of things. We've built a model. Uh, which is Cerberus, which is a rigorous semantics for a large fragment of C that is in fact executable as a test oracle. And I'll show you what that means in a bit. And where ISO is clear and uncontroversial, Cerberus follows that. Uh, it's not, I emphasize, an analysis tool or a sanitizer. You can't push large bits of C through it, but for subtle, tricky examples, it will tell you what's allowed and what's not. But then, when we come to the, the more difficult corners, uh, most of these end up being in the memory object semantics, the semantics of pointers and uninitialized values and all that kind of thing. Uh, there we've been trying to explore what the semantics should be in various ways. Uh, this is all work in progress, and indeed this talk is hopefully part of the progress. So, uh, so really, we have a big goal here. We're aiming to make C, in some years to come, have a clear, unambiguous definition that is executable as a test oracle, and also that really does support the language that people are using when they write C, especially for systems code. But at the same time, we don't want to unduly constrain compiler optimization, because then you people would say, ah, no, we don't like that. And we do want the source language semantics, which is what I'm going to be talking about, to have a very clear, ideally proven relationship to the behavior of the compiled intermediate languages, um, for which I refer you to the work by Nuno. Nuno, where are you? Nuno? Nuno! And his colleagues and other such people. Um, and really, we'd like to provide a smooth migration path to somewhat safer C, -like, C dialects in the future, but have at least somewhat fewer uh, undefined behavior gotchas uh, waiting to catch everybody out. Um, so what I'm going to try and do here is, um, and in hopefully conversations in the breaks and what have you, get a clear picture of what you think the source language semantics of some of these tricky corners is or should be and see if there's some kind of a plausible consensus about that. And we traipse off to an yet another WG14 committee meeting, coincidentally, next week. So if you say, ah, oh, yeah, it should be like that, we agree, then uh, we will be able to say to WG14 in a persuasive way, yeah, yeah, all these LLVM people, they're fine with this. Whereas if you say, ah, no, 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 it should be like this, and you persuade us, we can tell them that. And if you're just a hopeless confusion of different opinions, 
then we'll make something up <laughs> and try and persuade WG14 of that. So, uh, so I'm going to talk first about uh, the bit that we understand well, which is uh, Cerberus. I'll show you some live demo to add a little bit of adrenaline and excitement to the proceedings, because it'll probably go wrong. Um, and then we'll get into point of provenance and uninitialized values and a couple of other things. And this is only going to be a sample of all of the questions about C that we might ask, uh, but probably enough for a um, morning talk. Uh, I am focused on C here. Most of this, we think, should be kind of the same for C++, but while we can just about manage to read the C standard, uh, reading the C++ standard beyond the concurrency parts is beyond us. So, uh, sorry. So, Cerberus, then. So, if you want to replace that 702 pages of prose, what kind of description could you replace it with? So there are lots of sort of programming language semantics technical choices you could make here. But what we've evolved into, well, not quite, what we've um, ended up doing is to define the semantics of C by translating it into a purpose-built, uh, much simpler language, which uh, we call core and then define the semantics of core with essentially a definitional interpreter glued on to this memory object model. Right. So Cerberus as a tool is quite a bit like a compiler. Right? You take C, it takes C source, you parse it, you desugar it, you do type inference on it, and then you have C abstract syntax type annotated everywhere. And then the interesting part is the translation of that into core, which I'll show you in a moment, and then the uh, operational semantics of core glued onto this memory object model. So that can give you, and that's structured so that it can give you, for small programs, the set of all allowed executions, not just the one from a particular compiler implementation, and also uh, the set of all undefined behaviors that, it, that this small example might exhibit. So the structure's a bit like a compiler, but the goal is not much like a compiler. Uh, I just now look at one, one clause of this translation. Right? So this is a compositional translation. You take a, like each piece of C abstract syntax gets expanded into a chunk of core. And we just look here at left shift. Right? So on the left of the slide, uh, we see the C standard text for left shift. This is one of the kind of the well-defined and easy to read parts of the standard. I, I like this one. Uh, each of the offerands shall have integer type. The integer promotions are performed on each of the offerands. If the value of the right operator is negative, the behavior is undefined. If the value of the right operator is greater than or equal to the width of the promoted left offerand, the behavior is undefined. And then more and more and more. So we translate this little bit of text here into some core. I'm not going to explain what core is in detail, because there's no time, but some core that's really just doing an explicit check. You know, if this thing is less than naught, then we get this undefined behavior. And then, uh, if the value of the right operand is greater than or equal to the width of the promoted left operand, You do an explicit check, and we might get that undefined behavior. So there's a really close correspondence here. We are able, because we have designed core correctly, to get a really close correspondence between the different little bits of the standard and our description of the behavior. Cool, no? Well, we think it's cool. OK, so now let's try and see this. Live. This will be fun. Oh, this will be especially fun because I can't see it on my screen. OK, so here, is that big enough at the back? OK at the back? I congratulate you on your good eyesight. Um, so here's a really complicated C program. It really is, right? 
So what's going on in that C program? There's uh, the lifetime of X. There's the unspecified evaluation order between the arguments of plus. There's some integer conversions uh, going on. There's some signed arithmetic and some checking for whether that's bad and some potential undefined behaviors if it is bad. All kinds of things are going on there. Right. So if we, um, let's see, what should we do? Let's first just, oh no, I didn't want that. Um, first, we'll just parse that and type check it. All right. So this is, don't try and read this too much, but this is just a, a explicit description of the typed AST of that thing. Yeah. It's interesting here that you can see here, uh, in some places, the reason why this thing has that particular type, bit of typed AST is actually down to some particular clause of the standard. And you can click on it, and it will bring up that clause of the standard. We probably haven't got all of those, but uh, it's still nice. So then we can translate that into core. Sorry, this is quite hard to navigate here. Huh? And, oh, okay, you get quite a lot of core. Um, but I'm not going to explain all of this, but uh, we see the lifetime of X. There's a creation and a kill of an object. Right? That's de delimiting the lifetime of the thing. The unspecified evaluation order of the arguments to plus, somewhere in here, there's an unsequenced evaluation of the three and the two. There's um, an awful lot of semantics handling whether things are specified values or unspecified values. A lot of pattern matching on that. Uh, somewhere in the middle of all of this, there, there's a plus. Okay, the C language source plus has all this funky behavior to do with overflow and what have you, but the core plus is just plus on honest mathematical integers. It's quite easy to understand. So wrapped around that, you see, uh, like over here are explicit calls to integer conversions with the right kind of type. And wrapped around that is an explicit call to catch, catch exceptional condition um, for these signed int thing gets, right? So that might give some kinds of undefined behavior. So the translation is really spelling out uh, a whole pile of this subtle stuff. Let's look at the, uh, oh no, let's, um, let's look at the next example. Um, this is a really complicated program. Right. What does it do? Well, it does a left shift by minus one, but in a slightly complicated way that probably your compiler isn't clever enough to recognize. Is it? Nobody thinks it is. So um, if we execute that, so now I'm going to execute that exhaustively and really try and find all of the executions of it, and it will say, oh, there's an undefined behavior. Well, that's what we want. Let's try a fancier example. Okay. Allocate two things, and take their addresses, convert those to uint pointers, and compare the result. What are the allowed behaviors of that? David thinks that's implementation defined. That's interesting, because I disagree. I think that could be non-deterministically true or false. We can argue about that later. This is the kind of thing we do a lot of in this project. Right. Um, so in a flat address space, at least, with a sensible implementation-defined mapping from pointer values, uh, uint pointer t values, these things could be allocated this way or that way. Right. So any concrete implementation is going to do one or the other in any single execution. Um, but we would like to be able to find all of the allowed executions so that we can test whether implementation behavior is legit by just doing a subset check. Right? So here, 
um, to do that in one mode of Cerberus, we'll do those allocations symbolically. It will just create some symbolic addresses, and as computation proceeds, we'll accumulate constraints over those addresses. Um, and then we'll ask Z3 as an SMT solver to solve those constraints every now and again, or see if they are solvable, um, and proceed with a really a potentially quite large search. So if we execute this, we'll get, oh, the set of two possible outcomes. Actually, there are quite a lot of executions here. There are 12 executions. Probably there's some evaluation order um, choices going on as well, which end up not mattering. But you can end up with a zero or one. The constraint solving, though, I mean, it's not just telling you, um, it's not a stupid thing, right? So one can, if we have a fancier example, okay, what does this do? Three objects, this is pretty hardcore. Uh, so if the address of X is less than the address of Y, and the address of Y is less than the address of Z, then we return whether X is less than Z. So is this uh, um, less than operator transitive? So we are, in fact, doing a semantics. We're arguably not doing totally arbitrary C because we are building in some assumptions on the address space. Right? But the constraint solving, when we try and run this exhaustively, will you know, morally consider all possible shapes, you know, x less than y, y less than z, z less than x, blah, 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 blah. And it will be able to deduce uh, the transitivity of this thing. So if I execute that exhaustively, we'll get quite a lot of executions. So we had to look at 258 executions, and in uh, almost all of those, that comes out true, and sometimes it comes out um, in the case where the, the precondition didn't hold. Okay, maybe that's in now enough about Cerberus for a moment. Let's go back. So now let's talk about the hard stuff. Well, point of provenance is kind of the easy part of the hard stuff. So we think uh, the ISO is hopelessly unclear about this, but we have a proposal which hopefully you can all agree with. We'll find out. And then after provenance, we'll talk about uninitialized values, and nobody will agree about that. So what does provenance mean? Well, what's a point of value? What is a point of value? Anybody? No, it never works. Complicated. Complicated. Correct. Uh, so in the dawn of time, um, you know, when Kernigan and Ritchie were starting off this whole mess, it was very simple. Just a numeric address, a machine word. Yes. But now, uh, well, at runtime, it's probably a machine word, except in, you know, fancy implementations. Uh, but in 2001, the WG14, in its wisdom, said in a defect report committee response, implementations are permitted to track the origins of a bit pattern. They might also treat pointers based on different origins as distinct, even though they are bitwise identical. Okay. Well, implementations do exploit this. One can see, one can write little tests, and one can ask you people, and... Uh, both of these will say that sometimes alias analysis, alias analysis is using knowledge about the origins of pointers in order to reason that they are definitely distinct and might therefore do some, I don't know, uh, constant propagation or something, some optimization based on that assumption that these pointers are distinct, even though they might actually have the same numeric value just right now. Right. So we see that. And from the point of view of this text, that's fine. Uh, one ends up doing optimizations which would not be sound in a concrete model of C in which pointers were just numbers, 
but in um, a model of C kind of like this, uh, all of those programs have undefined behavior. So that's okay. So this is not totally crazy, but what does it actually mean? Right? This is a committee response to a defect report from 2001, which has, uh, 17 years later, still not been incorporated into the actual standard text. Right? And actually it really matters, right? It determines whether quite a lot of code is legal or illegal, and it determines what your alias analysis and optimization passes are allowed to do. How many of you are uh, alias analysis or optimization people? Okay, I want to talk to all of you. Um, okay, so, so here we're trying to make you know, something precise in the spirit of this uh, committee response. And after talking to a whole bunch of compiler people and language people and what have you. So the, the basic idea is quite simple, conceptually. So with every pointer value, we're going to associate a provenance. And what's a provenance? It's either a unique ID that identifies the allocation, the dynamic allocation that created that thing. Or some pointer values don't have any provenance at all, so the empty provenance. Or, and this is a bit more debatable, the, a wildcard provenance that we'll get back to. So every pointer value has one of these things attached to it. But obviously, uh, we don't want to do that at runtime in normal implementations, because that would be expensive. Um, only things like you know, David and his colleagues Cherry implementation would do that. Um, what we're adding these to, we're adding these to pointer values in the C abstract machine of the standard <coughs> to define what's allowed and what's not. And we have to do it for pointer values. We also have to do it for integer values, as we'll see. So we add this sort of ghost data across the whole abstract machine. And then whenever we do a memory access via a pointer, we check that the provenance is what it's supposed to be and have undefined behavior or maybe something a bit more subtle otherwise. So if you do access a pointer, access via a pointer that has a single provenance ID, the constraint that we propose is that um, the numeric, the address of that access has to be within the footprint of the original allocation with the, that I, provenance ID is associated with. And if you do access via a pointer that has empty provenance, it's undefined behavior, uh, with a little get out clause for device memory. And if you do access via a pointer value with wildcard provenance, well, all it has to be is within some currently allocated object. So that's kind of simple, but then you need to understand when you do operations on pointers and integers, how these provenances are combined and propagated. So let's have a look at that uh, with some examples. Um, so we've got a lot of questions, and for each question we've got a test case. Uh, and I emphasize that these test cases, some of them are natural code, and some of them are obviously totally pathological code. Right? The point of the test cases is not People sometimes misunderstand this. Not that we think this is all code that compilers should support. The point of the test cases is to delimit what should be allowed and what should be forbidden. So we have examples on both sides. So here, this is a classic example. I think this was basically in DR260. Allocate two objects, take the address of one, add one to it, that's allowed. Uh, so now that in some executions on some implementations, these two pointers might have the same numeric address, depending how that allocation was done. If they do, then maybe we'll try doing an access via P. So in a concrete semantics for C, this would have defined behavior and this would mutate Y. But in a provenance-based semantics, uh, that the provenance of that pointer value is the provenance of the allocation of x, which doesn't match the numeric address where we're trying to do a write. So this has undefined behavior. Um, so that's what people seem to want these days. And that undefined behavior licenses 
optimizations that are assuming that P and Q are not aliasing down here. And you can see those optimizations fire even on this example uh, in some implementations. So this seems to be what people want. It's certainly surprising to a bunch of C programmers, but hey. Um, okay, then this is another kind of easy consequence, right? If you can't cast a pointer into int pointer t and then back and then use it, then, well, that's not right. So we make the casts between pointer and integer values preserve the provenance associated with the value. That's quite easy. Seems to be what people want. Hmm. Okay, now we try something a bit uh, more edgy. Uh, two allocations, pointer to one, pointer to another, subtract those two integer values, and then add that offset onto the pointer to the first thing. Does that give us a pointer that we can legitimately use to access the other object? People look unhappy and they shake their heads this way. Does anyone want that to be allowed? And which of you are definitely sure that you don't want it to be allowed? And which of you think this is crazy shit and you shouldn't have got into computing in the first place? <laughs> Correct. Um, so that's an interesting lack of, lack of certainty there. I thought you would almost all say, that should definitely not be allowed. Okay. Um, lots of other people seem to think that that should not be allowed. Uh, and in our proposal, in our you know, current proposal, we are forbidding this. And the way we're forbidding it is by making this subtraction of two things that have different provenances have an, an empty provenance result. And then this addition of a pointer value with, um, so that has a provenance of x, but that now just has the empty provenance, so that whole thing will still have the provenance of x. So in our proposal, it's not legitimate to use that. And the, the plus side of that is that the compiler is allowed to assume that these two things are still not aliasing, which we think you probably want to do, but if not, fine. So, so part of it goes with the territory here. If we're trying to define, to actually define uh, what's allowed and what's not, then we have to make choices, and some of those have consequences that people might or might not like. So if you forbid this, which people tell us they want to, then this also forbids the classic Zor linked list trick, which you know 20 years ago people might have been sad about, but now uh, at least David says nobody cares. We'll see if that's true. Yeah. Uh, it is true that systems code, no, you can't hide anymore in that chair. It doesn't go down far enough. <laughs> um, it is true that sometimes you have you know, real low-level systems code that does need to do inter-object address arithmetic of some kind. Right? And there, one should probably allow, add to the language, some kind of escape patch to make that legal, and also tell the compiler that it's not supposed to do this alien, alias analysis just there. OK, next example. This is a bit long. You might not want to read all of this, but the question is simple. Can you use bit manipulation and casts to store information in unused bits of pointers? So it seems clear. Code depends on this. Uh, if the language standard and the compilers didn't support it, then uh, there would be angry mobs outside the door of you know, kernel hackers and what have you, and you'd have to change your minds. <coughs> so, um, so our proposal supports this. We go to some trouble to support this by taking care that these operations that we're doing on these values preserve provenance in the appropriate ways. Right? And by requiring the set of unused bits in pointers to be an implementation-defined thing, not just something the standard wibbles about. Um, next question. So you can construct pointer values in lots of ways, right? You get them from allocations, you get them from pointer arithmetic, but you can also, C is a wonderful language because you can futz with the representations of things. 
in some sense, that is why it exists still. So you can construct pointer values by constructing their bytes. So if you write um, like a very stupid mem copy in user code, and you use that to copy this here pointer value, and then you try and use that copy to dereference it, should that be allowed? Yes? Definitely yes. No? Okay. Um, so we're, we're with the yes people there. If this didn't work, uh, lots of C code would be broken. So we make that legal by tracking that provenance through each of those representation bytes. And then when you reassemble a pointer value to try and use it at that point, uh, because at least some of those representation bytes have the right provenance, and none of them have a different provenance, we regard the result as having uh, that provenance of the initial allocation. Right? So our semantics allows this behavior. Uh, consequences. If you do something more complicated with pointer values, you know, so suppose you uh, encrypt a whole pile of pointer values and then marshal them out and then read them back in and decrypt them, well, then you've done a lot of operations of them of exactly the same nature as that inter-object pointer arithmetic for which we said you get an empty provenance. Right? So our proposal does not let you do that by default. Again, in the rare cases where you are doing that, maybe you need a compiler escape hatch, sorry, a language escape hatch. Uh, can you make a pointer by uh, outputting it and then reading it back in and then using it. Sadly, yes, and real code does rely on it. Um, so this is what really why we introduced this wildcard provenance. It's not completely clear that's the best semantics. When you read that back in, you have to somehow make up a sensible provenance. And that can either be a wildcard or one could do in the abstract machine a dynamic check of whether the, va the numeric value that you get is the address of some currently allocated object. Those would be subtly different semantics and they would affect the alias analysis that you're allowed to do. So if you have a strong opinion on that, let us know afterwards. Um, okay, so now we get to cases where ah, it's really unclear. Can int pointer, can integer arithmetic be used to mimic pointer arithmetic. So this is an example that Martin Seabor, who's one of the WG14 people, mailed to us last week. Um, make an array, make a pointer to the first element, shift over into the integer domain, and do a little bit of integer arithmetic to the second element of the array, and then go back into pointer land and try and use that for an access. Should that be allowed? Yes. Okay. And no. And now you see, this is really useful. So most of you are not committing publicly to an opinion, but there was a clear, a clear dominance in favor of allowing this, um, which we can communicate with Martin about. Um, we'll see. Um, so you could invent a semantics that forbids this, and I emphasize this to, to say that we're not totally wedded to the proposal that we're making. We want to end up with something well-defined that everyone agrees with, and we kind of expect that we'll have to mess with it a bit in order to get there. Um, I think, so time is ticking on, so I think I'm gonna skip this extra subtle question and um, say that there is you know, a concrete proposal that I'm talking about. It's a bit wrong, especially the diff to the standard text is a bit wrong, but hopefully this seems kind of uncon uncontroversial. So I'll do another quick straw poll here. Uh, kind of uncontroversial, you might go along with something like this, yes. Fair few of you. And no. Oh, come on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, again, same sort of state. Um, definite preponderance in favor of yes, but not that many people committed. 
Okay, let's talk about uninitialized values. There'll be fewer examples and more swearing. We did a survey. Some of you might remember, in 2015 we did a survey. We traipsed along to Euro LVM and lots of other places electronically in, um, where was it? In London somewhere. Um, and we asked 15 questions, to try and keep it simple, and we were trying to, to find not you know, random sea hackers on the internet, but people who supposedly knew what they were doing. So we sent this to LLVM mailing lists and GCC mailing lists and this kind of thing. And we got a decent number of responses. But one of the questions was this. Is reading an uninitialized value or struct member, and we're asking about the semantics of compilers here, not of ISO, is it undefined behavior or at the opposite end, is it just going to read memory and give you an arbitrary stable value? Or is it going to give you an arbitrary but unstable value, maybe with a different value if you read it again? Or is it going to make the result of any expression involving that read unpredictable? Or what? <coughs> so, yeah, before I show you the answers, uh, Let's try that again, again with a, another of these shows, shows of hands. Sorry for all of the exercise you're getting this morning, but uh, probably it's good for you. Um, so option A should be undefined behavior. Okay. Should or is? Should. Uh, ah, uh, sorry, good question. Um, I think the more interesting question now is not what the survey said, but let's, which was what is, let's ask what it should be. Okay, what well, it should be. A, quite a few of you. B, some significant number of you. A C, a couple of you. And D, ha, it does in fact match the original survey, right? <laughs> so, uh, so it's basically, we get a bimodal distribution. Uh, lots of people, so lots of people then, they were asked what uh, their compiler or their favorite implementation does, and they were split between undefined behavior and it actually reads memory. Okay, it's gonna be a little tricky to reconcile these camps. Let us poke at the substance, at the reasons for these, uh, a little bit more. So there's certainly a consensus uh, that if you do, you know, if your code has an entirely uninitialized read, that is probably a programmer error. And um, it's probably convenient if the compiler can for it to report uh, that to you. Yeah. But, and we can also see current compilers certainly do exploit, well, certainly do give unstable values for repeated reads, right? I think last time we ran this on, ran the examples on your compiler, uh, it does that. Yeah. You can see it. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem necessary for compilation to have totally arbitrary behavior in those cases. And it doesn't really seem useful for programmers to have totally arbitrary behavior in those cases. Right? And even that amount of instability can be quite confusing for debugging and for code that, for, for running code that does have some bugs in, which I believe all code does. Yeah. So, so maybe this is not the most useful semantics we could possibly think of for future C. Yeah. Um, and in fact, really, the very notion of undefined behavior that the C and C++ standards use is too crude a hammer for this kind of thing, right? Because it's conflating. Some people say, you know, this should be undefined behavior because it's a programmer error and we should be allowed to catch it and report it when we can. And some things are undefined behavior because we want the freedom to optimize and therefore we want to make some assumption, but actually we could constrain the resulting behavior in a, you know, not total whole program semantics destroying way if we felt like it. And sometimes, you know, for example, when you do a wild write to arbitrary memory, there is no sensible way to constrain the resulting behavior. 
So the, the current you know, concept of the standards doesn't discriminate between these. If you look at the ISO text, this is very confusing. There are trapped representations. Well, people think there are trapped representations. Trapped representations, in, if you read carefully, are particular object representations, so concrete representation values that do not represent abstract values for which merely reading them, except a, except a character type, is undefined behavior. So these, they're called trap representations. They might trap if you read them, but they don't, certainly don't have to. Um, but then common implementations don't actually have any unused representations at most types. Right? If you look at int min and int max and the size of int, there are no spare representation values that could possibly be trap representations. Right? So if you really read this carefully, uh, trap representations are usually not a thing that exists, except perhaps at type bool in C. I'll talk to you afterwards about signaling NANs. <laughs> um, OK. So then, if we just forget these for a moment, because of this, then types without trap representations, uninitialized reads, undefined behavior, if the L value designates an object of automatic storage duration that could have been declared with the register storage class, friends never had its address taken. So this seems to be and we were not there at the time, so I don't know, a confused attempt to try to handle the itanium not a thing behavior, which some of you will uh, more or less dimly remember. Uh, as far as we can tell, it doesn't actually handle that, and it confuses everybody. We think that's wrong, it should probably just go away. Uh, interestingly, despite this fact, that you know, mostly there just aren't, there can't be any trap representations if you read the text of the standard, uh, several WG14 people have told us that the intent of this text was to make uninitialized reads at non-character type always undefined behavior. So there's a moral for you. Not sure what it is. Um, okay, so this is a bit confusing. Um, so what should it be then? So this part seems clear. Uh, if a non-struct uninitialized read, if the compiler can detect it, it should and it should tell you. But where it can't detect it, what is the, now the most useful semantics for us to give for future C and C++? Right? Undefined behavior, blah, 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 blah. Or, in fact, because these are usually programmer errors, they're usually quite rare cases. Huh? So maybe we could just insist that um, the compiler will assume that the result is zero in such cases at least for static and thread and automatically uh, storage duration things. Or maybe you might, in some cases, where you particularly don't want to have surprising semantics, you might well want uh, compiler options that give you either this or this. In fact, my inclination, so three weeks ago, I was saying B here. And the proposal we put to WG14 is basically B everywhere. But now I think probably we should have this and this and compiler options to get either of those two. Um, Sorry, can you explain how if the compiler can't detect it, how does it make zero? Are you saying that you default everything, initialize everything to zero? That, 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 that's the F case, yeah, that's expensive. I know that's expensive, but sometimes it's nice to have code that actually works. That is the best choice, I agree. Far OK, uh, let me very quickly, because time is running out, let me now rerun uh, that little question of what should the semantics be after this little dialogue. Uh, A, less popular or more tired. B, nobody. One, one. C, one, two. Uh, D, quite a few of you. Uh, e, uh, remember E and F are an option to do. So E, a few, F, few, interesting, okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, time is, let's see, quite short now, yeah. So let's uh, skip over that question and let's not talk about padding. Usually padding shouldn't matter, but when it matters, we'd better have some semantics for it that doesn't let programmers, doesn't make programmers be unable to prevent leakage of security critical information via padding. So uh, there's a proposal for that. And then there's a whole bunch of other interesting questions, um, which I think we're not really going to talk about, like uh, this one that David produced. Um, yeah, when should we be allowed not to use out-of-bound pointers, but to construct out-of-bounds pointers? So it seems that lots of code does that. ISO forbids it. ISO is very clear on this for once. It definitely forbids it, but the corpus of code out there uh, disagrees. So what should we do? Let me know in the break. So to, just con to conclude, I think the basic message here is kind of uh, simple. So, uh, so, so mostly us, so I come from a programming language semantics background, right? And most of us for decades have given up C as a totally lost cause, C++ even more, right? Wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. This write code not in C proposal, it's the best. Yeah? But we're only here because we don't see a way to get there from here anytime soon. And it is, in fact, I think, possible to improve the state of the definition and the actual language. So hopefully we can do that a bit. Uh, that is all I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. We have five minutes for questions. I will run the mic. Uh, <clears throat> I just wonder if you've talked to anyone uh, from the C++ Standards Committee about this? So in uh, recently, not very much. For, the, for that concurrency stuff, we were very involved in the C++ Committee, but now our brains are too full. Uh, but clearly we should. I, I would strongly urge you to do so. Um, notably, the C++ uh, Standard has actually addressed some of the issues you've brought up. Um, for example, the uninitialized read has changed. C++'s semantics for uninitialized reads are no longer C's semantics. It has a different semantic model that tries to address some of these issues. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to look at it. Um, and notably, your, your options B and C, I'm not sure that they're different. I, I, I don't know that there's an important difference. Maybe it just doesn't fit on a slide. Uh, but the C++ com committee seems to be moving in that direction. So, so, so they are different. If, if, so I would guess they're moving in a B-like direction, which is not totally crazy. But yeah, we should talk. Later. I, I'm really not sure what, you're, what difference you're, you're highlighting between B and C, but again, maybe later. Any other question? Oh. Um, so I'm wondering what the end goal of this is. So you've got some kind of executable uh, version of the semantics. Um, the, the missing link that I, I'm wondering about is how do we check whether compi compilers are conformant? Um, you, you were saying that it's some kind of subset check, but will, will there be some sort of automated or mechanized way of doing this for particular imp implementations? Well, so, so our goal, our principal goal at the moment is not to um, make it easy to do automated testing of you know, many aspects of real compilers, but we are aiming to make it at least in principle possible to do that. So it's a whole other problem, once you've got a well-defined semantics, which is executable in principle, to be able to you know, use that to uh, test on, you know, like you can imagine doing um, generation of uh, non-trivial random C code uh, with CSmith or other such things, probably not exactly CSmith, that ex and then pulling out from your compiler what the alias analysis thinks is going on and comparing that with uh, Cerberus as a reference. So we're not directly working on compiler testing, but this should enable a bunch of work on compiler testing. Hi. 
So I don't know whether it's specified in the standards or not, but let's say an optimizer uh, figures out that a 64-bit pointer can be compressed to 32, 16, and 8, mm -hmm. and then you represent it by smaller and smaller you know, data types. So do you see some challenges in what you are doing with that? Um, so so you know, that, that kind of corner case is the case where by actually making a choice of a semantics rather than writing wibbly text, um, the people that want the compiler to be allowed to do that and the people that uh, have some particular assumptions on the behavior of code that futzes with pointer bits get tensioned against each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, why don't you think that uh, you're trying to build an oracle, which essentially answers a question how this particular piece of C code uh, uh, shall behave? And why don't you take any industrial grade compiler, shall be GCC, uh, C Lang, or whatever, and use it as such an oracle on a particular hardware? And in the cases of undefined behavior, it's uh, like it's saying enough, and uh, it's uh, it, it just just an arbitrary decision. So what, why not use it as an oracle? <laughs> so um, so so C like almost any large scale industrial specification is necessarily a very loose specification. Right? It allows a lot of implementation variation, but intentionally so. Right? So if you want to say the current behavior of LLVM is C, that's basically a return to you know, uh, the 19... 50s or 60s, in which the definition of Fortran was the canonical implementation. You nod and say, oh, yeah, that was fine. But uh, the entire body of source code of LLVM, let's say, is not what you might call a highly readable definition of a programming language. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, and all of the other implementations or implementations on different platforms that behave slightly differently would be made illegal by uh, that choice. So I didn't think that flies. Um. We are reaching the end uh, of our slot. Uh, so let's thank our speaker again. Mm -hmm.